mid and center, uh, center and western part. Good morning. When I was asked to make this webinar on multiplate, I was thinking what should be done because this webinar has been done even before. And uh, I was guessing on what needs to be shown. And that's where I chanced upon a couple of issues uh, that I encountered while I was creating the program for a part. And I said this is the best time to do this webinar and to show how you're going to overcome this uh, problems. So I chose two parts today. One is a simple part which you see in front of you today on the screen. And the other one uh, is a more complex part that you might have seen in the uh, invitation that you got for attending the webinar. Okay. So I'm going to show you multiplied on those two parts. Often I get questions on uh, how do we compete with the other uh, uh, systems, how can we cut down the time for cutting on multiplayer and, uh, and so on. When it comes to time, it's basically several things that matter. From the programming side, there are a couple of things that can be done. Okay? Uh, first of all, use I machining. But then uh, the question is how far can you really go with I machining? The issue here is if I take I machining and go into the these cavities to cut, scoop out the material, I might cut down the roughing time significantly, but I might increase the rest roughing time using multi-blade also significantly because you will have a lot of air jumps, air moves, the tool parts may not look nice. The machine will not behave nicely. So we have to draw a line on where you need to stop eye machining and from where you need to start multi-blade technology. So if a customer has given you a block around cylinder to start off with, then I would say the initial stock Okay, from a round block to what you see now on your screen should be a target for the first time machining program. Scoop out. I'm talking about milling, okay? When it comes to Milton, that doesn't uh, count. So take the time machining, rip up the material very fast, and then start multiplying. Okay? So you need to make that that judgment, where to stop by machining it from where you need to begin your multiplayer. My advice to you is <clears throat> not to use I machining completely because then it will not only increase the uh, increase the time for multiplayer uh, press roughing to cut, but it will also make the tool path look quite ugly. So you'll have a lot of jumps because it works on a stock based principle, so it will keep moving from one spot to the other using retract. So it will look really happy. Stop here and from here you begin your multiple day process. All right. <clears throat> the other main uh, thing that you need to keep in mind is that if you want to do roughing with a taper ball nose, evaluate the part. Okay. For example, I would like to measure what is this distance out here? What is the minimum distance? It's about 9.5 millimeters on here, and what about this side? This is about 9 millimeters. So you know that you have got pretty good distance inside, uh, where we could take, uh, for example, this tool out here, this tool, the taper ball nose and you could go down to those, that area without worrying about whether it would reach the entire part or not. However, if you look at the space available on top here, okay, again, let's measure it just to have some perspective. This is about 22 millimeters on one side, and we also have probably 
the same amount on this side. It's about 20 millimeters. Whereas here, it's much more. It's, all, it's going to be double. So the question arises, do we use a taper tool all the way down? Or can we use some bigger diameter tool in the beginning and cut down that time drastically by giving it more depth and sideward movement? And then only for the last few passes, use the taper tool. This is one way in which you could dramatically reduce your cutting time. So this is what we're going to see today on this part. I think that everyone knows about what Multiblade is all about. Multiblade is basically a technology that helps you to program impellers and blisks with splitters or without splitters easily. It's very powerful and it's very reliable in terms of giving you results. Now people ask who are, who've used 5-axis for a long time and when they come up with multi-blade, I remember this cartoon, in fact I tried to search for this cartoon, so let me draw that for you. When people uh, make a comparison between two aircrafts, uh, Boeing and uh, Airbus, okay, so this is the cartoon that they draw, or the guy, the Airbus, they make this cartoon. Okay, this is Boeing, the console of Boeing, and this is the console of Airbus, okay. So what do you have in the Boeing console? You've got many buttons. Uh, you have got some sticks, buttons, 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 more buttons, some more sticks, some more buttons, some more buttons, okay. A lot and lot of buttons. So this is the Boeing console. If you go to the Airbus console, which they call as, I don't know how many of you know, but Airbus aircrafts are what they call as fly-by-wire, okay? It has just one button, on and off. So what they're saying is not realistically one button, there are many buttons. What they're trying to tell is the difference between how you fly Boeing and how you fly Airbus. The gist is to tell guys, to tell users that flying an Airbus aircraft is much more easier and simpler than flying Boeing. I don't know because I'm not a pilot, but it's something I saw on the web. For people who have been machining such parts using uh, our regular 5-axis, they know and understand the pain of how difficult it is to do this part. It's almost like flying a Boeing aircraft. Whereas, Multi-blade makes it as simple as an Airbus, switch on and off. So, multi-blade is a very simple product, but it's very powerful. A lot of research has gone behind it to develop this particular product. So, the, the whole goal was to keep it simple and yet provide you with a reliable result. Now, one of the reasons why the product is more reliable, I'll explain you in a moment, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add an operation from the template. The template, I've saved the template so that it becomes easier for us for applying to that or creating tool parts. Otherwise, I'll have to keep typing in those parameters. So the geometry that we are going to select today, I already have the geometry. You can select, or rather you need to select one set of blades. That includes, if there's one splitter, then it includes two main blades and one splitter. You may or may not select the shroud. Okay, it's not compulsory that you select a shroud. So, one set of blades, that is two main blades and splitter, needs to be selected as a part of your geometry. Okay. Now, if you're going offsetting between hub and shroud, you need to select the hub. In this case, I have an offset surface. You don't see it, but this is the surface. That's my hub. And the shroud here is this. I just select a piece of that shroud. I don't need to select all the shrouds, just one piece. To let Multiblade know what the shroud looks like. Right. Now, once we have selected this, the uh, 
blade splitters, fillets, and hub and shroud, what basically multi-blade will do is it will translate this entire set of geometries that you selected. It will create a mesh, okay? And it will transfer this mesh to the multi-blade engine to start calculating the tool path. The difference between our generic five axis engine and multi-blade is the fact that our generic five axis engine uses directly nerves and surfaces and doesn't use any kind of a mesh, whereas the multi-blade technology uses mesh to calculate the tool path. And therein lies the, the issue that multi-blade tool paths are much more reliable. You can predict the results. Whereas with nerves, it's very difficult to predict how you're going to get the result. Because the nerve surface itself is pretty complex. Even though if I just select this surface, it's, it's, it's a pretty complex equation for, for the system to analyze and come up with a solution. And that's why the reliability factor dips down. Whereas with mesh, it's simple triangle. Three points, it's triangle. All it needs to do is to check to the triangle. So the, the, the solution is very simple. Thereby, the reliability goes over the roof. Okay, so you select offset between hub and shroud. Now, the tool path here looks very nice, beautiful, when you use the offset between hub and shroud. But practically speaking, the hub and shroud business doesn't sound nice because the area here is more than the area here. That means the area towards or the height towards the leading edge is more than the height at the trailing edge. So it's basically going to take a bigger depth of cut here and it's going to come with a lower depth of cut here. So you might have rubbing action towards the leading, uh, towards the trailing edge. So practically speaking, this is not the best way to handle multiplayer. The best way is to use an offset from hub. The tool part may not look what they call sexy, it might not look beautiful, but it will be very practical. The, cut, the depth of cuts will be constant throughout the geometry because it's going offset from the hub. The tool I'm going to use here, okay, now because I said you could save a lot of time, I'm going to use a bonus tool of 16 millimeter, okay, levels. Best part of multiplate, I told you. When I say multiplate, you should immediately imagine the difference between Airbus and Boeing on and off switch. So most of the things here are automated, including the clearance definition where it calculates an imaginary sphere, a safe sphere to where the retracts will happen. Tool path parameters, technology, my depth of cut since I'm using a bigger tool, I can go higher. And because I'm using uh, 16 diameter, I can easily go to about four or five millimeter step over. Sorting, I'm going to do a zigzag cutting, and I'll start from the left blade and go to the right blade. So I go that way. I won't touch the edges, but in the next part, I will give you a solution to some issues that have come out with my blade. Tool axis control, nothing, just that I've put some limits to the tool axis, so 0 to 91. I don't want to, to go beyond 91 degrees. Link, you can see, imagine the on-off switch of AMS, so it's all automatic. Gouge check only if it creates gouges with the edges and blades. I need to use it, otherwise it's not necessary. Stock and transformation. Now, the best part here is I just need to define how many pockets are there. In this case, there are one, two, three, four, and five pockets. So I will say I need five segments, and I want to machine all five segments. Or I can say just machine three out of that five. OK, nothing more. Just going to save this. And let's hit the Calculate button. Let's see what happens. The best part in multi-blade, because it's mesh-based, the calculations are very fast, because the solutions to triangles are very simple.
Okay. You can see that the toolpath has been calculated, but we have some issues that are too many retracts. Why there are too many retracts is because I told you the distance here was only 9 millimeter, right? So it could not machine completely. It's less that material. Which means that the 16 diameter cutter cannot go all the way down. Fair enough. That's, that's a no-brainer that it can't go all the way down. So what we are going to do here is I'm going to go back and change from offset to hub to offset between hub and shroud. And I'll start at zero, but I'd end at 75%. Okay? Or maybe 70%. So I don't go all the way down. And I'll reduce the step over to about four millimeters. That's it. And let's hit save and calculate again. Okay. This looks much better. You can see that it's gone all the way up to 70 percent. And it's scooped out the majority of the material much faster because the tool that we're going to use later down is a much slender tool. So it can't do the scooping as fast as probably this tool could do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy this and I don't really need to copy, I'll just call the template again. Create, sorry. I'll add operations from template. Roughing. Okay, and in this case, I'm just going to re-pick the geometry again. Okay, the hub is faces one, and the shroud is that. Fair enough. The tool here I'm going to use is a taper mill, 12 with corner radius 2.5. In the technology, however, I'm going to start at let's say 65% and go all the way down to 100%. By distance, one millimeter and step over of 2.5 millimeter. Okay, everything else remains as it is. We're not going to touch that. Let's calculate. Now, you could ask me a question. We used a 16 diameter animal. That means we could have left a corner radius of R8. And now we are using the uh, tape of almost, which has a corner radius of only uh, 2.5 R. So it's going to get a lot of uh, cut on the side. Of course, it's going to get. There is a way out, but it takes a little bit more time. That's why I don't want to show you that. And the, the uh, way here is to copy this operation, paste it below. Okay, let me do that. It will not calculate, but I'll do that. Paste. And change the tool to uh, the tape of all nodes. Okay. Leave everything the same. You can say one millimeter and two millimeter side step. Sorting, everything is fine. You jump to the stock and transformation. Okay. And give an over thickness of let's say minus 0.6. But don't use the stock definition style automatic. Use the selected operations and select the first operation and hit calculate. Now what it is going to do is it's basically going to run the first stop, calculate, check where the material is remaining. Since we have said that it needs to machine only between 0 and 70, it's obviously not going to do the roughing again because it knows that material has already gone out. So all, the, all that it's going to do is it's going to just remove the material on the areas where the material is more than 0.6 millimeter. Okay, so it will just remove, and then what you can do is you can simply put the next operation that we just calculated. So I'll suppress this, edit, and let's put the rotation is five and five here to run the calculation again. Okay, that's done. I'm just going to have a two-part 
preview. Right. So now I have two toolpaths, one going from 0 to 70, and the other one starting from 65 going down all the way. So we know that we could have used the tool that we used on the second toolpath all the way from top to bottom, but that would have, that would have uh, wasted a lot of time for us. So we now can split the toolpath and run it from almost 70%. So we know that in 70% of the area, we are cutting down the time drastically because we use a bigger tool and then use a smaller tool and finish the roughing. Okay, so once we have the roughing done, we can either do the semi-finishing and finishing, those are same. So we will add a finishing uh, toolpath again from the template. Uh, simple finishing and blade. Okay, and the geometry here is the finishing can be done in two ways now. <clears throat> you could again pick the main blades, okay, the group, uh, the, the complete group here, right, and again make, pick the hub and the uh, shroud. The shroud, yes. So you could pick the entire group. Okay, let's keep point three and let's pick the paper volumes two. Technology here, you can say 15 passes. And we are going to trim on the trailing edge. So we don't want the tool path to go around this. We just want the tool path to stop here. So we're trimming it on the trailing edge. It's one way, so we're going to do one way cutting, not the bidirectional. Okay. Perfect. Everything else remains the same. Let's run the calculation. Now why I'm showing you both the ways is that you should understand which one to select and which one not to select. Okay, that's done. Now this is how the toolpath looks when you see or when you select a set of surfaces. It has two main blades and uh, and a splitter. However, this process has a disadvantage, and that is I can't rotate it. Okay, because if I rotate it, one of the blades is going to be machined twice. So. Although this looks very nice, practically it's not a solution. So what we're going to do here is go to the geometry and I'm going to change to a different geometry. So I'm going to select only one set of blade and we're going to run the calculation. So then it becomes much more easier to run the uh, rotation. So you finish one blade, rotate it five times and you have the result. And then you apply the same result also for the uh, smaller blade. Right, so we have for the smaller, uh, for the main blade, I have not applied the rotation because I want to make some changes to make it look nice. Now what I'm going to do is instead of making it jump every time up and down, I'm going to make override the link. So between layers, I'm going to remove the automatic because I want to have some control over it and I use the direct blend option and let's rotate this five times so that we machine the entire part. Save, okay, and let's calculate it. Well, let's put it in parallel, okay. And in the meanwhile, I'll apply a next template and this is for machining the hub. So I want to apply this. Here again, I need to select the set. Just single blade won't do so because I want to machine the area between that set and the hub here is phase one. Okay. The tool that I'm going to use is a 12 volumes, a uh, tape of volumes. Two path parameters. Zigzag. I'm going to start from the trailing edge. 
and edge rolling is automatic. Okay, fair enough. Rotation again is five, five, and let me save it. And I'll put this into parallel calculation. We've already finished uh, one of them. And you can see what happens here on the previous one. Instead of it jumping up, I've nicely pulled the toolpath out. It goes around the plate and goes back again. So what we can see is that we don't have a, we don't have a tool lifting up every time. It's just moving very nicely around the uh, blades. Now the same technique can be applied to the splitter blade. So it's the same. And this is how my hub would look like. So what you have at the end is a very powerful solution. Of course, we did not do the uh, uh, fillet finishing. So let's apply the fillet finishing also. And in this case, I'm going to use a single blade. Not this, sorry. Yeah, a single blade. And the hub is this. Tool that we're going to use is the same. Two pump parameters. We're going to have four cuts from both sides, from hub side and the blade side. And it's going to be one way. In the link again, I'm going to remove this and I'll use the direct blend option. Okay, let's save, put that in parallel calculation while it runs. Let's look at the other two parts of being generated. So we have the blade finishing and then we have the hub finishing. So multi blade basically gives you the Option to machine right from roughing to semi finishing, finishing of the blades, it's the main blade and the splitter, finishing the hub, finishing the fillets, all of them in less time, very less time. Imagine the same thing people would take about a day or two to calculate in generic facts because a lot of things have to be done and still they were not very sure about the result. What multi-blade has done is it's brought down the time from probably a day or two to 10 to 15 minutes you could finish off this part. Right? So let's look at how the fillet looks like. Beautiful. Again, you can see that it's been pulled out and moves around. So the fillet also is finished. You don't have to worry about how the tool is going to tilt, how it's going to look, what elements I need to do for uh, guiding the tool in the tilt because tilt is one of the most critical things in, in 5 axis. So if you look at how this would, tool would look like, it's very nice. Traversing all out and just machining the fillet. All right, so having understood the basics of uh, multi-blade, we can now safely move to the next part, which is a much more critical part. Uh, I thought it was a very easy part when I started it, but I realized when I started doing the tool part that it was not as easy as it looks. So let's open the part. This part. I created this part out of my sheer imagination. I had a, I had a part with me, so I combined two multi blades and just mirrored it, created the other part because I wanted to create something for Milton. So I came up with this part. But then after I realized that this part is much more complex than, than what I thought it would be. Now you can see that there are some operations that I've already done. Okay. Now this is just to save time during the webinar. Now, we are going to use an ATX 1000. Uh, basically, uh, this is a Milton machine. Okay, it's a nice Milton machine. How does it look like? Let's hide all the other elements and look at the machine. You might have seen this machine exists in our, our gym, uh, technology, Germany Technology Center. So, it has got a very uh, two spindles. C1 and C2, or what they call here as C1 and C3. It has got a 
I had the tilts. It has got the x-axis and y-axis on the head, and oh, sorry, the z-axis, y-axis, and x-axis on the head. And then you have got a lower turret, again the same set of axes. But then there is a nice thing for this particular head, and that is that it can tilt. Okay, it can tilt from zero to two twenty-five degrees. Okay, so it allows machining of parts where your head can't tilt on this side to machine this part, so it just tilts itself up to cut the part. So we're going to machine uh, the part on this. Now the only thing I did the uh, NC was unkept was to move the part from main spindle to back spindle. Okay, fine. Now this is only a, a demo, so don't take it. Uh, don't. Don't take it in a real sense that this part really could be done on the machine, but just show you what it can do. Right. Why did I say that it's so difficult? Have you got to see now why it's so difficult? So I'm going to add an operations from template, complex roughing. Okay, upper turret means better. Let me save this. Okay, the geometry. Let me select the geometry. The geometry in this case are these faces. So again, there is one set. And the hub here is this. No shroud because I'm going to go offset from hub. The tool that I'm going to use is a 16 corner radius for taper ball nose. Levels, two path parameters, everything is the same. OK. So, something, bring it to the uh, default settings. So, this is the default setting, and uh, of course, I don't want any rotation, just going to make one. And let's save this. And what I'm going to do is move it up because this came below. I want to come. To it, put it before the upper turret retracts. Right, so this is the uh, toolpath. I'm going to put this toolpath for calculation in parallel, and I will start defining my uh, finishing toolpath. So again, I'm going to add uh, operation from template, and it's a complex uh, main blade finishing toolpath. Okay, the geometry in this case. Uh, Let's check because there are two blades in this. Yeah, so this face is four. Hub here is face one. And the shroud here, because I'm going to go offset from hub to shroud, is I think five. Yes. Five shroud. Tool, I'm going to use a smaller tool, it's a 12 corner radius two, paper ball nose. Okay, in the two path parameters, maximum distance is one millimeter, so I'm going to use a step over of one millimeter. You can see that I'm not starting it at zero, but I'm starting it at 10 percent. So there is a difference here, and I'll explain to you why I'm starting it at 10 percent once we have the toolpath ready. And because this particular toolpath has a, a radius at the end, I can't use the trim at the trailing edge because I want the tool to go around this edge here. So I will use full. Sorting, because I'm using a full, I get an option for spiraling. So I'm going to spiral from the leading edge. Tool axis, zero. So we're going to see the effect very soon. Rotation, just one, because I'm going to create it for only one. Let's save. And put it for calculation in parallel. OK. So that goes in parallel. We have the first roughing ready. Okay, that's pretty nice. So what we're going to do now is we're going to run this on our simulation, but we are not going to do the verification. We just want to see the machine simulation. So let me put it for simulation, machine simulation, which will allow uh, about 30 seconds because it's a large part. So what it's basically doing is it's moving the part 
and the tool path into the machine simulation environment. Right, so we have the part held in the chuck on one side, of course. Uh, to make it look even more practical, what I could have done is I could have had a center here, okay, and I could uh, push uh, basically the C3 axis, the Z3 or Z4, this one. Yeah, I could have pushed this to hold the center here and then machined it so that it gets uh, a nice uh, uh, support on the other side. But anyway, this is a demo, so I don't have to worry much about all that. Let's run the simulation. And I want to see certain areas, what happens. I want to increase it because I want to bring it to an area where I know the problem is going to occur. Okay. occurs when it goes close to the splitter, okay? Now, you can see there are several things that are happening in this part, okay? Probably on your screen you might not be able to see it uh, very quickly, but what you can see there are a couple of things. First of all, I go to the front view, tilt of the head. This is very dangerous because assuming that we're going to move uh, the Z3 axis close here, this could be catastrophic, okay? So that's one. The other thing that will probably happen is the C axis that is rotating here at some portions can tilt so much that it, it can take, for example, you can see here, C axis has tilted so much that it has taken the head down into this area. You can see there's a collision straight away. Okay? I'm not sure how many people have noticed this, but first time I noticed this on a Haas machine in Bangkok, and we were trying to do some uh, multi bit trials, and I really had my two things in my mouth straight away when it went down. But unfortunately, unfortunately for us, it didn't make much of a difference at that time because we could uh, manage it because the tool length was a bit more than what was needed. So we could tide over the crisis. But otherwise, it's seemingly very difficult to tide over this crisis. So when I started preparing for this webinar and I hit upon this problem, in fact, this problem is much more exaggerated later on, but in, at least in this version, the uh, problem is still there. And it's not much, but still there. So I started scratching my head on what could be the problem. And I realized that the problem here is being caused. Where is the toolbar? Okay, because it was a parallel calculation. The problem here is being caused by these friends of ours. You see this extension? These are the toolpaths, or these are the portions of the toolpaths that are causing this strange shift in C axis and strange moves in B axis, okay? No matter what you do, no matter what limit you put, it will not eliminate. So I started figuring out how we could fix this problem and I chanced upon the solution here. I go into the uh, toolpath parameters and on the edges I have got trim by length and I know the problem is on the trailing edge side, so I put a 
value of one millimeter. So I'm going to trim the tool part by one millimeter on the trading edge. And let's save this. And let's run the calculation in parallel so that we can have a look at the other calculations as they progress. So we have the first multiplied uh, this finishing tool part. So if I run the simulation in uh, HostCAD, and this is how my tool part will look like. OK. Now you can see here that the first contact is made slightly below. That is the reason, because we've put the percentage of 10, right? Now, another problem why I put that, pro that percentage 10 was if I don't put that 10, then this particular point out here on that tool is in contact with that edge. Now, if you look, again, if I go to paint, don't say this. This is how my blade was, and this is the edge here. So this is the edge where you have got the contact of the spear. Right? I call that as a spear. The spear is in contact. Now, when a spear is in contact with the edge, there is no way I can control the tilt of that tool because the edge can have directions ranging from this to directions ranging here and direction ranging here. So this tool, if I take the center, can have direction this way, can have direction this way, depending on which portion of the edge tool's uh, contact is in contact with the edge. So it is tightening. So that's why you will see the first cut happening in multi-blade. If you have not used that, something like this. Completely at an angle, tilted at an angle, and it starts cutting it. Right? So in order to avoid that, I push the contact of the tool downwards so that it doesn't get an edge contact, but it gets the contact of the surface where the normals are more pronounced. They're more clear so that it can maintain the tilt with respect to that normal. So it's very important. Either I push the tool down by a certain percentage, or if I can, I just extend the surface by, let's say, uh, equal to more than the corner radius. So if it's 2.5, I'll extend it to 2.8. And my starting point can be pushed in such a way that the contact can still be at the edge. But now I have a pronounced surface that's giving me a direction. So it's very important to maintain the, uh, the direction here in uh, of the start percentage. Move it slightly down so that you don't get that embarrassing situation where the tool almost becomes horizontal. In some cases, it becomes almost horizontal. So you avoid that situation. OK, so I'll, I already have the uh, tool path here ready with me. And let's run the simulation again to the machine simulation. Okay, that's ready, waiting for me to start the simulation. Let's run it pretty quickly. Now, most important thing here is when you're using the trim, you can also apply, you can also apply the machine angle limits. Okay, because I've seen that the machine angle limits work very nicely when you're uh, trimming these, this tool path, keeping it within the edge inside. Okay, so in order to avoid an embarrassing situation of the uh, C axis tilting too much, and because the C axis is tilting so much, the head goes down, up, and very close to the part, you can avoid that by trimming off the trailing edge because that's where the problem is there. You can 
remove that particular portion of the toolpath, trim it, and also use the limit and keep it within the limit, especially for machines like this where tilting of the head to 90 degrees can cause crashes. You can keep it at between 0 and 80 or 0 and 75, okay? So uh, from the roughing side, those are the two things that you need to keep in mind, especially for parts like this. For the uh, finishing, I explained to you the, diff the reason why that start percentage of 10 was used. The other thing here that probably we are going to do is, of course, the other splitter finishing and half finishing still remains the same. There's no difference to it. The other thing here is to have a look at what happens when I apply. Again, let me apply template. Okay. And this time I'm going to use the back spindle. Okay. Coordinate system is Mac 3 position 1. And the portion here is that we're going to have the geometry on this side. the one, sorry, let me check which slide I have a sheet. Okay, so I need the geometry on this side. Okay, I don't have the geometry, so I would need to create the geometry. That's not a big deal. So let's select our geometries. There are some lot of changes happening to multiplay. You will see the versions that are coming up. For example, if you have a multiplay to be cut, then what we're doing now is to select uh, select the geometry and then apply transformation with the newer version. You don't have to do that. You just have to say that this is my geometry. It will do one. It will find out how many transformations are needed, and it will do that by itself. So there are a lot of changes coming up in Multiplate, and it's an ongoing process where we'll also introduce SWARF for finishing the side of the blade. Okay. Left out certain things. So add those two areas. Okay. <clears throat> and the hub here is you can see that we need to wait for some time. That's because it's writing the uh, the mesh to or the mesh uh, is being translated to system. Okay, everything else remains the same. We don't need to do anything. Rotation, however, is going to be switched off. Let me save. Back in my pair. Okay, and let me put the calculation in power. Okay, while this is being calculated, I want to hear from you if you have any questions, because after this, I just I'm just going to do some simulation and uh, we're going to end the webinar. So if you have any questions, just put it on the chat area, or you could just raise your hand and I'll allow you to ask the questions. Otherwise, we'll have to look at the boarding screen. To see how it calculates. Yeah, there are no questions. Amod, you can continue. Okay. Right. So uh, the whole idea here is, of course, the first part that you saw is uh, already available with you on your uh, uh, on your installable solid cam installable. You have that part. It comes with the standard solid cam installation. Whereas this part, of course, it's not a uh, it's not a part, confidential part, so this part will be shared to you. You can use this for two reasons. One is to show the Milton capabilities because there's a lot of turning and milling involved into this. I've created the part in such a way. And the other thing is you can show five axes on both sides, that means on the main spindle as well as on the back spindle. 
So this particular part I will share at the end of my webinar. I'll upload it and Eddie will then share this uh, part with everyone. <coughs> Okay, while this is calculating, because you can see that the fillet here is uh, a variable fillet, it would be a nice idea to also add uh, fillet finishing. One. The geometry here is the main blade, so I've got to select only one portion of it. Not everything. So we'd like to select a single blade. Yeah. And then you have the hub here. Check if I'm doing the right thing. Once more. Yes. Tool is the same with our parameters or cuts from either side. Okay. Everything else remains the same, so I'll save it. And let's put this in parallel. So we have done our roughing on the other side. So I can actually take the finishing and we can take these process and look at the machine simulation. Roughing that's being written to the machine simulation. So the best part of doing parallel calculations you can do several things at a time. You don't have to wait for the other operation to finish. So run the uh, simulation. Okay, I don't want to run that simulation again. I just want to show you how. <coughs> Retracting, okay, my upper turret is retracted. And then lower turret retracts, rapid, feed, and the part taken back. Okay, of course, you can see that my lower turret, uh, the uh, next operation, the Head has come down. This is not the right solution. That's because my next solution is not to use a second angle pair, but I need to use a first angle pair for the back spindle. So that that should take care of it. So if I run now only this simulation, it will output the first angle pair, and you will see a different kind of uh, process, uh, simulation altogether. Okay, that's it. This is how my this is going to work. So we can actually use uh, this part to actually show the capabilities of solid can both in Milton as well as five axis. In fact, there are some areas on the part I'll show you here. You can actually show some other things also. For example. You could do an eye machining here with four axis because this is a wrap geometry. And then you could machine these faces using SWARF. And then you can finish the bottom floor using the pocket wrap function. So a lot of things can be shown 
on one part where you could show turning, threading, milling, drilling, eye machining, five axis, multi-blade, a lot of things can be shown in just one part. This part again will be available for you to download. I'll send it to Eddie after the web. In fact, I'll send a finished part with a lot of operations inside it and you can use that. Either you could remove the operations and put your own operations or you could use the same part and show it to your customer. All right. Thank you very much for attending the webinar. If there are questions, you know how to get in touch with me. You could write to me or Skype me or you could just put it in the chat bar. Eddie, I'm done. Thank you very much, Amo. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, we'll see you next week again. Goodbye and have a nice weekend.